it's it's the hero show welcome to the hero show everybody starring the irrepressible andrew bernstein and the the resurgent robin begley i am andrew bernstein and you are indubitably robin begley how you doing today robin I'm doing great, Andy. I am radiating with joy because we're going to talk a little bit about radiation today. And the father of the nuclear Navy, big time hero in many people's eyes, not in everybody's, but yes. looking forward to celebrating him today. Yes, of course, we're talking about Admiral Hyman Rickover, uh, 1900 yes. to 1986. And I guess if you, you know, and, and Rickover certainly was the father of the nuclear Navy. And, Yep, strengthen strengthen the United States Navy and there, and thereby the, the United States military more broadly enormously. And I guess Robert, you know, if you're if you're a bona fide hero, you probably do make enemies. You rub people the wrong way. And Rickle was certainly was a tough kind of guy and you know hard to get along with. He had very demanding, very stringent standards. Had a sharp yes. tongue. Did not yeah. tolerate fools well. And he certainly he's got he exhibited a lot of admiration. <laughs> a lot of people don't like him. But he got things yep. done, didn't he? Uh, he did, and out of the pages of Atlas Shrugged. These are one of the kind of heroes that you read about in Atlas Shrugged. They're not, <clears throat> not every single one of them until they go to Atlantis is really easy to get along with because much of their life they're dealing with incompetence and uh, people who don't know how to get things done and people who want to take shortcuts. And Rick Over was none of those. He had incredibly high standards and lived up to them and influenced many, many people, uh, several of whom we'll mention right. as right. the show and, goes. Right. And speaking of your heroes and Atlas Shrugged, who are hard to get along with, Ellis Wyatt comes to mind. He chews yeah. Dagny out. She, no, it's not yeah. even her responsibility. He chews her out you know, early in the story, and Dagny takes it because you know, Jim, Jim Tag is responsible for the, for the mess, but she represents tag a transcontinental she's got to take the verbal beating and tells him you know mr Y, you shall have your transportation and of course dagny's as good as her word and you know she dagny got things done wyatt got things done dagny's a lot easier to get along with than why it is but rick you know that's a that's a personality trait it's very you know, you're yes. irascible or you're easy going whatever you know uh it's it's not it's secondary rick over may have been mm -hmm obstreperous and argumentative and tough to get along with but you know the bottom line is when you're professional and especially when you're dealing with nuclear power something as powerful as that and potentially dangerous as that uh you get things done that's that's by far the most important consideration that's right andy so let's start with this background born 1900 uh and in it's a border of like Poland or the Czech Republic, someplace, but of Jewish descent. His father comes over to America and earns some money, has to leave the wife and two children over there. They're facing persecution by, by the USSR is, is dominating. So the, with the, the pogroms back then, even before the, the Russian Revolution, father saves enough money to bring them over to New York City, Lower, uh, Lower East Side, 1906. And Rick Over starts working at age nine. They actually leave New York and go to Chicago. The father becomes a tailor. And Rick Over's earning three cents uh, an hour holding a light over wow. somebody who's, who's going uh, a wow. lamp over, over three, somebody three who's getting work. Three cents an hour. Three cents an yeah. hour. Even I get paid more than that to teach philosophy. You know, <laughs> <Three cents>. <laughs> slightly <laughs> with inflation, an Andy. Are you sure about that? I don't know. That, that, that. This is <laughs> this is true. That's that's a that's a good point. But you know, you know, you're reminding me something, Robert. Um, Thomas Sowell, the, the great Thomas Sowell, the, mm -hmm. you know, he's now 92 years old, I think, and hopefully goes on for many more years yeah. of good health. Uh, but one, one of my favorite books, he wrote dozens of books, right? And um, mm -hmm. one of my favorites is Ethnic America, where he examines all the history of all the different ethnic groups in America. Right. And he makes it, uh, Thomas Sowell is a really great researcher. He makes a fascinating point. At least look, it's fascinating looking back on it today because we grew up in the New York area, you know, mm -hmm. in the 1960s. By, by then, the, the stereotype of the Jewish doctor, the Jewish MD, you know, was was widely known. I even mentioned right, last week. I even mentioned Leonard Finkelstein, right? And you said it's probably fifteen of them. You know, yeah, the, the MDs right. you know, in the New York area. But 
Parmesan points out in the, in the early 20th century, it was it was many years before you, all these these Jewish immigrants, it was many years before a single uh, Jewish teenager graduated from a New York City high school because they, yeah. they, were, they, they were so poor that these kids were working age nine, like yes. you said, you know, three cents yeah. an hour. So, you know, th- th- that, mm-hmm. that, that, that came later on, you know, the, the cultural emphasis on the, the cultural emphasis in Jewish culture on education, you know, manifest itself after, you know, families reached middle class status, moved out of the Lower East Side to the Bronx or Brooklyn, and then the kids could go to school because the parents can make enough money to support the kids. But, but yeah, hard working from, from a very early age, three, working for three cents an hour. Can, uh, even, yeah. can you imagine? Uh, no. But that's what, mm-hmm. that's what you do when you're poor and if you're industrious and want to escape poverty. That's what you do. That's what you do. You do, you know, man's got to do what he's got to do, right? Yep. Then during high school, he's working seven, he gets a job at Western Union and he's working 70 hours a week while going to high school. I mean, wow. this is wow. this is just, you know, phenomenal. So what is he doing? He's developing a work ethic. Okay. And he's learning from people old, older than him how to how to do things, how to do things efficiently so that um this will set him up in uh in later on in life, uh, goes to the Naval Academy uh, when he's uh, 18, 19 years old. And World War One is breaking out now. Just we can we can track his dates because he's born 1900. So right. so is uh, Howard uh, Rourke. Was it Howard Rourke born in 1900? That is true. <laughs> that is All true. Right. Yeah, that's a good year. That's yeah, it's a good year to be born uh, in fiction <laughs> and in fact. <laughs> right. Right. So he goes to Annapolis. And how do you get into Annapolis? A poor Jewish kid. That's that's uh, you know, around the time in 1918. And, you know, he, uh, you know, we're mentioning so much of it. The, he faced racism for being Jewish, you know, his whole life, basically, because he's trailblazing in fields that they're not known for, you know. And so, uh, but he did know somebody. And this was the thing. He constantly proved himself for people who were above, but for decision makers. They saw ability in him and they saw, you know, this, 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 uh, attention to detail and wanted to help him come along. So yeah, gets into the Naval Academy. <clears throat> uh, 1922, he's on a naval ship, a destroyer, and he falls in love with it. And he goes out into right. the Pacific. And <clears throat> then 1927, he becomes lieutenant uh, in the Navy. <clears throat> then takes a little break, goes to Columbia University to study engineering. I mean, that was always his uh, his subject was engineering. He wanted, sure. he wanted to learn any, everything as possible. And it's interesting, Andy, he talks about Columbia. He says, that was the first place where I was taught to think and not to memorize. Uh, and so... <clears throat> Uh, education was a major part of his life, which we'll go into more detail later on. But uh, knowing this in Colombia was a big, you know, this was a big part of his life. And he meets his future wife there, Ruth uh, Masters, her right. name was. And they marry in 1931. And he converts from Judaism to Episcopalian. Yeah, I want to, let, me, let, me, let me jump yeah, in go ahead. For, mm-hmm. for a sec, a couple of things. Um, he, he conf- I, I assume she's an Episcopalian, and that's the reason why he can. Conf- yeah, I don't think he'd do it on his own. Yeah, <laughs> right. right, right. And uh, and yet you said that even though he's he's a he's a Protestant for for most of his adult life, he still faced anti-Semitism in in his career. Is that is that right? I yeah. Guess, I guess I guess yep. for, to a tribal mentality, you know, if you're yes. born into this, if you're born into this religion, then you as you that's it. You, you can't, you can't, there's a, well, that's the Nazi view. And there's a lot, unfortunately, I know, right. you know having, having grown up in Brooklyn, I know there's a lot of Jews who think that too. If your mother's a Jew, I heard all the time that you're a Jew. I go, wait a minute, Jews is a religion. <laughs> you, know, it's, you, you accept yeah. or reject it volitionally. But right. a lot of people are tribal in that mentality. And uh, then, you know, and then there's that prejudicial, uh, you know, that prejudicial view that's, that's very strong. Fortunately for us and for the future of the U.S. Navy, Rick Hogan was able to overcome it. But before we move on, there's one other thing I want to mention. He was at Columbia yeah. in the 1920s, right? Yes. Uh, it's, it's interesting because in the 1920s, John Dewey is John Dewey, a, yeah. is, is, mm-hmm. is a superstar in Columbia's philosophy department, and his leading disciple in progressive education, William Hurd Kilpatrick, heads the philosophy of education department at Columbia University Teachers College, and they're disseminating poison 
uh, and had a had yes. tremendous <clears throat> deleterious impact on the American education system. Fortunately for Rick Hover and for the rest of us, he didn't major in education, but he was an engineer. No. So Columbia's science departments were, were presumably much more rigorous than, uh, you know, yes. in, than in, in, in certainly in education. So, so, yeah. so anyway, um, so, okay, so, so he, what, would he get a <clears throat> master's degree at Columbia? In engineering? He got a master's degree at Columbia, then, then he was back, <clears throat> back in the Navy and uh, in, the, in the 30s, throughout the Depression now, he's married, he starts, he's supporting his family. Uh, you know, they're, they're, the depression's going on. Nobody has money. So he, you know, he's working in uh, in the Navy and he's putting money aside the way his family did for him when he was uh, young. And one thing on aboard these ships, one of the things he's interested in doing is reducing like the oil consumption that that these ships burn a lot of oil. So he's already looking for ways to uh, to do this more efficiently, which is foreshadowing uh, the the nuclear issue that comes a, a, a decade or so later. <clears throat> and then Pearl Harbor happens, and he's he was not there, but he did go to uh, the attacks, the Japanese attacks, uh, December nineteen forty. One and uh, he re he rebuilds one of the ships that's completely uh, not destroyed but damaged and uh, gets it back in service. Uh, is working under Nimitz, who we talked about in the Midway episode, oh, and Nimitz championed. Uh, you know, we we talk about people how he gets. Uh, this was a pattern in his life, but Nimitz really helped. Rick over because one of Rick one of the problems that Rick over faced was there's a chain of command. Uh, I'm not a military guy, Andy, but there is I, I have friends oh, yeah. and I know that there is a yeah, chain yeah. of command you are supposed to follow. And Rick over had no he had no use for that, so he would just go to Nimitz. And when the time came for this idea about uh, going nuclear with uranium atoms and all this different this possibility. Uh, Nimitz was said, yeah, yeah, that's that's a good idea. And uh, I could uh, just see, yeah, Robert, you <laughs> could just see the animosity festering. Because, yes, you know, you have yeah. you have guys in the chain of command above Rickover, but below Nimitz, and you're supposed to go yeah. through the chain of command, but the guys immediately above you don't have the vision that you have, and they don't see it. Yes. Maybe they don't want to see it, and they hinder yeah. what you know is progress. So you go over their heads to Nimitz, and Nimitz says, "Go ahead." And tells yeah. his subordinates, you know, Rick Hover's right. And if you just see, you know, people who are uh, who are mediocrities just will will they'll just fester. You know, that kind of resentment will just fester in in, in them. You're right. You're right, Andy. And the, and what room is there for an innovator who's in this kind of completely rigid, structured uh, program? Uh, not too much, except if you see if somebody sees your potential, as we talked about earlier, then they can they can pave the way for you. So, this idea of nuclear, the benefits. What 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 are the benefits for it on uh, Navy submarines? And yeah, well, he Rickover especially pioneered nuclear propulsion on submarines, right? Uh, that's right. The Nautilus was first. the first one. Yeah, the USS that's right. Nautilus. That's right. I remember the USS I Nautilus. There's a nice yeah. picture of him in front of the Nautilus. By the way, there's a real good PBS uh, program called uh, called Rickover. I think uh, the and the birth of the nuclear um, nuclear submarine, something like that, and uh, hi highly recommend it. Yeah, but, you know, I can re I can remember when I was a kid, let's mm -hmm. say circa 1960. You know, nuclear yeah. submarines were new. I think when the Nautilus was commissioned, like in the mid fifties. Right? That's right. And, yep. and, you know, and and I can remember U.S. You know, it was big news. Uh, I was eight, nine years old. That U.S. nuclear submarines had uh, had had gone under the polar ice cap. You know, from from one end yeah. in the, yeah. the Arctic polar ice cap from one end to the to the other. Uh, and you know, these these were these were all firsts firsts back in the late fifties and 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 early sixties. We take it. For granted today, but this was, you know, this was, this was really, this was re revolutionary. Have nuclear powered it, submarines, yeah, and the completely revolutionary. Yeah. Put him on the cover of Time magazine. There's a nice image of him on Time magazine with the atoms uh, swirling. That image of the atoms swirling around, and so his point was radiation. We talk, we, you know, we talk about radiation. A lot of the uh, people in the Navy, they 
consider the dosage of radiation, they're like, well, we're in the Navy. We could handle a higher dosage. And uh, Rickover was, he was adamant about safety. That was like number one uh, and how much a, a human can absorb. <clears throat> and he said, no, these standards need to be for everyone. So, uh, so uh, during the process, he, uh, you know, he enforced these standards. He was n safety ruled because if there's one accident, Andy, the whole program is out the window, you know, and part of this yeah, process you, was getting. You wouldn't go under the polar ice cap and the reactor goes, you're going to lose your entire yeah. crew. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. You know, and, and the, well, you know, part of the, whatever, whatever, this, whatever tough guy Rico was, he cared about his guys, right? He cared about the U.S. Navy sailors. He didn't want them dying from radiation exposure or anything like that. To totally, totally, Andy. And just, just to, to clarify again, the benefits or to get to the polar cap, you, how much oil would you need? You need to refuel quickly. So this was a again practical benefit of nuclear is that you wouldn't you wouldn't need to. You could be three months and they took, imagine being three months under in a submarine like underwater. Uh, that's the, I'm a little are, too claustrophobic to yeah, want to even think. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Three yeah, in, in sub. but that was that was the thing. So in the process, he's interviewing, and I got to tell you, so uh, one. At a, at a Toscon, I was uh, sitting down with one one of OSI's donors who served under Rickover and talks about the, the interviewing process. <clears throat> and there's a couple of things he would do, Andy. First of all, he cut off the, the legs of the front legs of the chair a little bit. So you're sitting, you're, you're kind of uncomfortable. The sun is beaming in your eyes. This is so the way like Rickover every, would set up his interviews? That's, make, this is the way he said it's uncomfortable. Okay, he's, look, he's looking for so, tough guys. I, I he's looking for tough guys. And he'd ask this question, you know, in that era, people are 18, 19, they're getting married, right? They're, they're planned marriages happened early in life. And he'd, he'd say, uh, the, the person being interviewed would say, uh, uh, I'm engaged. And Rick would say, okay, would you, this program is three years long. Do you want to postpone your, your marriage? And my friend, David, this is what Rick over asked him. And, David said no. You know, he's like, no, I'm I'm going on with it. So in the in the Rickover uh, documentary, there's there's one person who he asks, and the guy says, yeah, I'll I'll postpone the wedding. And Rickover pushes the phone in front of him. Call your fiance right now. Calls her, <laughs> honey. I'm sorry. I ha I have to I have to cancel. You hear her shrieking, you know, on the phone. And he's like, we'll talk later. He hangs up, and Rickover says, get out of here. You know, if you don't have the courage of your conviction, you know, to, to, oh to my go ahead with a plan, you're not right for my ship. You know? <laughs> Can you believe that? Oh, oh, my God. This poor guy just messed up his relationship with his fiance. That doesn't get the job on top of it. Oh, oh my God. Wow. So, so my friend David says no. So he stands up to Rick over. He sends him, the interview is over. He sends him in a closet for three hours. You're standing in a closet. There's a broom. It's pitch black. You don't know what's happening. Opens the door and says, "Okay, you're in." <laughs> so, so to, oh, up to like ten thousand people, Rick over interviewed through the course of his. And this life. was the and, this was the this was the process generally. <laughs> for many of them, you know, like uh, for, wow. nobody was comfortable. Let's just put it that way. Uh, but yeah. One of the people he interviewed, Andy Jimmy Carter. Okay, he interviews Jimmy Carter, and he asks Carter the question. Uh, did you ever, did you always give your best? And Carter says, no. And Rick Over says, why? And Carter did not have an answer. He didn't have an answer, but he didn't BS him. He said, I, I don't know. And yeah, well, if decades he his, later. If he gave his best when he was president, that's a pretty poor best. I'll tell you that. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But here, here's the thing. Carter uh, later on, after being president, writes a biography, and the 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 title is what you know. Do, did you do your best? Why you know? And and so that question puzzled him the rest of his life, and and he had incredible respect for Rick Over, you know this this young Jimmy Carter, and the roles were reversed later on. You know when Carter was president, uh, yeah, right. Rick Over had some. He, yeah, he he had and he had some responsibilities uh, that he gave to Rick Over. So the man is known for cutting through red tape, fighting with contractors, and like we said, getting things done. 1958 comes, the Nautilus is doing its thing, and uh, he gets his first of two Congressional Medals of Honor, and he just continues overseeing the project. 
for right. uh, you know for for the foreseeable future. So um, a, just let me let me jump in, in here for yeah. a second, Robert. Mm -hmm. I know you know we were talking about Rick Covey's stringent safety standards for for reactors yes. on on U.S. submarines and, and naval naval vessels more broadly. By contrast, the Soviet Navy trying to keep up, you know, and during during the Cold War yep. had, had many had many fourteen accidents. accidents. 14 yeah. different accidents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know how many deaths, you know, that that caused among right. sailors in, in the Soviet Navy. Yeah. But but we can thank Rick Hover for I think to this day, there's never been an accident, a, a nuclear accident on board a U.S. Navy nope. vessel. That's and, right. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, hundred three thousand ship years, they call it, of being out at sea without one accident. Uh, you know, uh, again, if the standards are high, the safety is the safety of nuclear is uh, it's unmatchable you know it's uh, yeah. simply unmatchable. right you know decades later when three mile island happened when carter was president they called in rick over and he and he did the investigation and you know and there was no damage to, to there was a couple of light no no humans died guess what <laughs> you know all the media sensationalism no humans died in, in three mile island and that's just a you know an example of people fearing we'll talk more about yeah. this people fearing the unknown right you know and, and you mentioned mean. previously that we should do a hero show episode on peter beck who was an expert yes. on, on on nuclear power and and, and you're right health we hazards should. of not going yeah. nuclear yeah, yeah. right mm -hmm. exactly and he and in that book in the health hazards of not going nuclear he, he called three mile island like the greatest disaster that what that wasn't you know or, or, or something yeah or, or something like that uh, but but uh, yeah <laughs> one well, thing he, that that I, I if we go to Peter Beckman, Andy, I got to say one story though. Uh, I think in the book, you know, Ted Kennedy was one of the big anti-nuclear guys, and Peter Beckman's like more people died in Chappaquiddick than in any nuclear. Yeah, oh, plant. talk about somebody with a biting tongue. <laughs> I mean, Beckman had it. He was yeah. he was an uh, immigrant from communist Czechoslovakia. Yeah, right? yeah. And we'll, uh, we'll get you. We'll yeah, get, I just want to say we'll one thing. Do. Also. Yeah. That book, the, the health hazards of not going nuclear, yes. and I, you know, I'm a complete novice, and I, I always tell people, look, you can read ten thousand anti-nuclear books. You only need to read one, you know, book in support of nuclear power, and that's Beckman's. But but he dedicated it to Ralph Nader and all those who worship the water he walks on. <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> i mean that's hilarious that is, well, that but, is. but i know i don't go back to, to our hero but they will get to back you know in a future mm -hmm. episode but um rick Holden, i know you know he was so focused on safety standards that his enemies thought that it, it it hindered uh their ability to to you know to do uh you know war games, you know, to, mm -hmm. to engage in tactical and strategic naval, right. you know, battles, you know, to really use the nuclear powered submarines and vessels to their to their full advantage. So I know that was one reason why, you know, he made enemies within within the Navy, his 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 obsessive yeah. focus on on nuclear safety standards. And but yeah. but he but you know he he's right. You gotta make he's totally sure right. you gotta make yeah. sure your guys are safe. So yeah. So yeah, the, yeah. the standards of radiation was one safety level. And then the containment, the idea of having a containment, uh, you know, uh, around these reactors was also his idea. So an innovator in engineering, you know, like the, the, this is something that uh, we, we have to credit him for. So let, now let's move over, Andy, to education. So we're in the late 50s. 1959, he writes a book, Education and Freedom. Okay, he's connecting the two between them. And he says education is the most important issue facing America today. And only a massive upgrading of the scholastic standards will guarantee the future prosperity and freedom of the republic. Massive upgrading, okay? So John Dewey aside, uh, because he knows the rigors of science, math, technology, uh, reason, you know, and logic, uh, and he sees that, the Soviets are ahead on that and other countries are, are ahead on that. And while America has this wishy-washy humanities, which is certainly gaining traction, that these students are not prepared. They're coming out of school not prepared. And we can only imagine, you know, decades later of more of the same. And here's where 
this idea, Andy, of certainty and of <clears throat> scare tactics with things you don't understand. People to this day don't understand nuclear, you know, the benefits of nuclear, which again, we'll save that more for the Peter Beckman episode. But when you don't understand something, even with coronavirus, when you don't, the media and the, and the ones who have a term, an agenda, they can dupe people who are just not sure when 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 they could just put fudge these numbers and make you scared you know scared to death and that has succeeded uh certainly in nuclear because it, it you know after three mile on they just shut down so so many uh stop building uh plants and uh and that was not rick Over's intention if the if the education was done the way he wanted i mean he just had some Incredible quotes about the linking independence to uh, to education and the, the thinking mind and what you know what it's capable of doing. Again, I think right out of Atlas Shrugged, this kind of mentality yeah. right out, out of Atlas. No, Shrugged. you're right. Um, <clears throat> ignorance ignorance is susceptible to, to fear, you know. And, and there's a couple of points that come to mind. Yeah. One, I'm reminded of your know, George Washington's famous quote that um, government, like fire, is a dangerous servant. Yeah, you know, the main mm -hmm. main point there is government's a servant, but he's pointing out, you know, fire can heat your home and cook your food. It could also burn your home down. Well, nuclear is a lot more powerful than just God and yes. power of uh, fire. So it's understandable right. that there could be this, you know, this this fear factor involved. But if somebody does the research and finds out, like like Peter Beckman argues, is by far the safest form of large scale energy production mm -hmm. you know, when you mm -hmm. have the you have the data. You know, you 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 see, you you see that, but but fear fear is a powerful uh, factor to to overcome. We see it. Uh, another issue, you know, today is with climate change. Uh, you know, yeah. again, if you if, if 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 you do the research, you realize the Earth is four point five or four point six billion years old, and you go back. In other words, it's a vast uh, has a vast climate change history, including yeah. ice ages. And, you know, the natural fact is you're overwhelmingly responsible for, for, for Earth's climate change, not human factors. But you, you need to right. do some research and you need to be a critical thinker and not an emotionalist, not going with your feelings. And Rick Hove is right. The American school system does that. decreasingly, not only, not only decreasingly uh, teaches the kids facts and, you know, and knowledge, but even more ominously, decreasingly teaches thinking skills, you know, basic reading, right. writing, and arithmetic yes. calculation. And if you're not a yeah. good thinker, well, then you're, you're even more susceptible to, to fear. And, and mm -hmm. let, let me just say one more thing. Sure. Rick Hover's book, Robert, was published, uh, what was the name of it? Education and 59, freedom? Education and Freedom, 1959. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, because Rudolf Flesch published his famous book why johnny can't read in 1955 just four years earlier wow mm -hmm. you know and you know and argued mm -hmm. because you already see you know you know intelligent minds and good thinkers people who have a rational methodology pointing out the horrors of the american educational system in the 1950s which only got worse yeah. since and what the panacea is and flesh is absolutely right there's remedial reading problems in america because american educators have jettison phonics in favor of the whole word, but that's it. That's the reason. Use mm -hmm. your know, systematic phonics. Teach the kids, you know, the the alphabet, the sounds of all the letters in the alphabet, the sounds of the combinations of letters. There's only 26 letters and 40 odd sounds. Yeah, you know, and mm -hmm. that opens up the whole world of reading, the whole world of knowledge. You know, Flesh is absolutely right. The educators don't want don't want to use phonics. They don't want rigorous academic training. And it's really an uphill battle. Uh, in the field of education, but that's the most fundamental field of all. So we carry on the battle. But I'm glad Rickover. I'm glad it, it, it's it's immensely to Rickover's credit that he recognized in the 1950s when you know things right. were bad, but not nearly as bad as in the as as it, as, they are, as they are today. That the educational field needed to be upgraded, it needed to be revitalized. You know that's greatly to Rickover's yes. credit. Yeah, and as much as I'm emphasizing his. Uh, his strength in engineering, he loved poetry, he loved the humanities as well. So it wasn't like he was one sided, you know, just the just the logical discipline. But uh, he saw the, the, you know, he saw the the benefit of reason, even in the humanities. 
you know, like it. Uh, yeah, like yeah even in, even the, in the humanities, that's funny. But yeah, that's yeah. They, they, the, who the, else the, is like that? You know? I, no, I, no, I mean, I, no. It's it's ironic. The humanities has been taken over largely by irrationalists. So you yeah. Know. But but anyway, I just want yeah. to say again to Rick Holden's immense credit. He, he he's writing this book in the nineteen fifties, published in fifty nine, like you said. In 1950s, he's running the U.S. Navy nuclear program, which is a more than a full-time job. Yeah, so again, yeah. you know, you know, he really deserves kudos for taking the time, you know, with his copious spare time, you know, when when he, when on, on Saturday or Sunday he might be playing golf, you know, whatever. Right. Gets 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 right. some rest to write this book on education because he realizes one how important the field of education is, and two, even in the 1950s, he saw the harmful effects of Dewey and the progressives, you know program he yeah. wanted to he wanted to fight it so good you know good for him that's that's you know, that's the act of a hero yeah and andy not only is he running this nuclear navy it's during the cold war yeah, things that's are right. heating up yeah, good point, you know, good they, point. things are yeah. heating up yeah, they sure <laughs> the are. cuban missile crisis is coming you know oh, yeah. and, and the 60s the the, the yeah, and the berlin wall the berlin wall is coming you know all that all that wall stuff is, is, is imminent all the stuff is imminent, and then just the the clash the uh, of the sixties. He's still doing his thing, you know, as much out of step as it might seem, you know, with with the American public during the sixties and into the seventies. Um, then in the mid seventies, Car- you know, Jimmy Carter runs and and wins the presidency. Uh, you and I are not not fans of Carter no. uh, by any means, but he does call in. You know, he d- he does praise Rickover as he's uh, Carter says aside from my father Rickover was the most influential man in my life and we wish he, he used some uh, of yeah, these yeah. rational you know the, these appeals to reason yeah that, wish, uh, wish Rickover had been more influential on, on Carter's life yeah but. yeah so he's he's getting up there in age you know so now he's like 1976 1979 is three mile island the guy's 79 years old he's still in there and uh, many people want to force out, you know, and then, then Reagan comes in 1980 as president <clears throat> wins the election comes in 81. And now it's like, okay, Reagan's people want him out. And the two have a sit down Rick over years on the phone. His wife hears on the phone that he's been forced out and he has a sit down with Reagan and starts yelling at him in front of Reagan's staff. Like that, that was the thing, <laughs> you know, he's got a temper. He's not holding back even to Ronald Reagan and Reagan tells everyone to get out of the room. And just the two of them are, are sitting down and talking and it's done in the, in the, in the documentary on Rick over. It's done well because what comes out of that meeting, no one says, you know, it was just between the, it was man to man because yeah. Reagan was being criticized as being too old as running for president and Rick Over right. was being criticized as being in his, you know, in, in his late seventies, eighties It's like, look who's talking, man. You know, I'm old <laughs> and I'm still competent to do these things, but sure enough. Yeah. He, he's, uh, he is forced out, lives the last few years of his life. Um, uh, and then 1986 passes away, uh, buried in Arlington uh, National Cemetery right outside of D.C. And just a full, you know, had this incredible kind of one of a kind type life. And, you know, the, the, the 20th century impact, you know, if we go f- the, the idea of nuclear, uh, you know, the benefits of nuclear power, the threat of nuclear weaponry. You know, the, and how that certainly stopped World War II uh, from uh, tens of thousands more Americans dying. Oh, at least, uh, yeah, at least, yeah, yeah, at least. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's his his legacy is nuclear, you know, innovation on one side, benefits of nuclear power, and then pr- making this appeal for education and freedom and linking the two. You know, who was the one that said, you know, basically a dumb population cannot be free. And one of the founders, Franklin or, or something like if you're not educated, you're not you're not going to know the benefits of freedom and prosperity. And that's what. Yeah. And you, you certainly can't be a, a knowledgeable voter, you know, and, and, and a right. citizen, right. citizen of the that's public. Right. You'll end you'll end up supporting demagogues like, you know, like yeah. Hitler or you know, somebody like that. Yeah. Yep. So I have I have his uh, philosophy of life. <clears throat> that I got from from one of his books, and it's a it's a bit of a quote that I want to read. And you know, we mentioned uh, Ayn Rand's epic novel, and let's let's see how this uh, this is Rick Over's own philosophy of life. He says, anyone for anyone seeking meaning for his life, a figure from Greek mythology comes to mind. It is that of Atlas, 
bearing with endless perseverance the weight of the heavens on his back. Atlas resolutely bearing his burden and accepting his responsibility that gives us the example we seek. To seek out and, and accept responsibility, to persevere, to be committed to excellence, to be creative and courageous, to be unrelenting in the pursuit of intellectual development, to maintain high standards of ethics and morality, wow. and to bring these basic principles to existence, uh, to bear through an active participation in life. These are some of my ideas on the goals which must be met in order to achieve a meaningful and purposeful life. Wow. That is, uh, <laughs> that's yeah, that that's sounds, a good quote. <laughs> that sounds like a quote from one of you know, the heroes in Atlas Shrugged. And, it belongs and, in Atlantis. Yeah, I'll, I'll, well, without a doubt. And I was just, while you were reading that, I was wondering, since Atlas was published in 1957, and the fountainhead in 43. I wonder if Rick Hope, and, and he's a humanities guy, like you said, by, by avocation. I wonder yeah. if he read Ayn Rand's novels. The, the, I, I would not, I didn't find it. I did some research, but I did not find anything. So I can't put, you know, words in his mouth, but I would not be surprised. I'll just say it that way. I mean, these words sound so much like Rand. Uh, Rand inspired, let's put it that way. But I, I have no evidence, you know, no yeah, direct exactly. evidence of that. Yeah. So I, I don't want to say, but... You know, what a life, Andy, what a life and what a purpose for life to add to uphold. Right, right. And and one thing we could say for sure for Admiral Rickover is his dedication to nuclear powered submarines and a nuclear powered Navy greatly strengthened the United States militarily. Yes. And, and, you know, against the Soviets or against any other dangerous enemy. Yeah. And, and and in that way, he, he protected the country that, you know, as an immigrant, yeah. so many immigrants love America. I'm sure Rick Hover yes. did also. He protected the country he yep. loved and millions and millions and millions of, you know, Amer American civilians. So that's that's an enormous, yep. enormous accomplishment. 63 year career, Andy, from Woodrow Wilson to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> All these wow. different presidents that's, that he served under. Can you believe that? <laughs> that's, yeah, he, he was the he was the longest uh, ranking, uh, yes. longest tenure in the United States Navy in history. Is, 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 that's is right, that? in history. Yeah, it's going to be hard to pass. It's gonna, frankly, it'll be hard to pass that. You yeah, because you start as a teenager, 63 years later, you're 80, you're 80, 81 or you're, 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 you're in your 80s. So that would yeah. yeah that would that would be hard to to sur surpass. Yeah, this was uh, this was a you know a great life well lived, and he made enemies, mm -hmm. and he stood up to them, and he fought battles, and for the most part, yes. he won. He won those battles. Yeah. And you know, just, uh, one last point I would say in in, in commemoration of Admiral Rickover is that to this day, I think uh, you know I'm hardly any expert on military strategy or tactics. Mm -hmm. But I think to this day, it's probable that the United States Navy is the most, assuming that you know, POTUS you know, is willing to deploy yeah, its power. It. Yeah, mm -hmm. the United States Navy is the, is the, greatest, uh, the greatest force in promotion of world peace you know, in, in the world. Yeah. Uh, great mean, point, you know, and we, we, you know, we've talked histor historically about the British Navy, the, you know, how, how dominant they were and important in, in preserving peace in the past. But certainly since Rickover, since mid 20th century, it's, it's just been the U.S. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, just think about it. If you're, a, you're, you're an enemy, you're, China wants to invade Taiwan. They've, they've coveted Taiwan going back to the, the inception yes. of Taiwan as a, yes. as a country. Uh, and uh, what stands in their way? Well, the United States is pledged by treaty to defend Taiwan. Do you want to tangle with the U.S. Navy? Uh, you know, right. and the answer to that is, is probably no. And the other thing that always boggles my mind is you have, I don't know how many nuclear powered submarines the United States has today. Many. Uh, like be, 150. Uh, I think, okay. I think, it could be, be submerged for months, like you said. Yeah. It could be in any ocean in the world. The, the yeah. Like two thirds of the Earth's surface is covered by ocean. Be somewhere in the Indian Ocean, somewhere in the Pacific, somewhere in the, in the Atlantic. You can't track them by satellite. They have nuclear powered, you know, they have, nuclear, they have, they have missiles, what is it, Trident missiles that they could, I think they could launch from submerged with nuclear warheads that have, could, could travel thousands of miles with, with, with formidable degree of accuracy 
and hammy you. And it, it, it's like, do you? No, I don't want to tangle with these guys. You know, you know, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm Putin or she, she or Rocket Man in North Korea, as you know, Kim Jong Un. No, I don't want to tangle with the U.S. Navy. This is too. This is just. Uh, this is too formidable a force, mm -hmm. and it keeps it keeps. I think, I, again, again, like if, if POTUS is willing to deploy its power. It's, it's the United States Navy, I think, more than any other force in the world that keeps these aggressors, you know, in, in, in check to the degree that they are. Uh, great point, Andy. In fact, imagine we could even do the flip. Imagine if a country like Iran had these kinds of nuclear subs or if China or Russia had need. What kind of world would we live in? Yeah. If the bad guys had this kind yeah. of stuff, we'd right. be <laughs> we'd probably not even be able to do the, this podcast. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the same, same kind of question. Same kind of question. Yeah, same kind of questions. If the Nazis had developed the atomic bomb before before yeah. the Americans did, it'd, it'd, be, right. it'd be a it'd be a horror. So again, mm -hmm. I, we we I think we could I think we could salute Admiral Rickover yes. because he more than anybody is responsible <laughs> for this power. You know, this nuclear yes. power of the United States Navy as the father of the nuclear Navy. So thank you, Admiral Rickover, for, for yes, preserving peace you. and, you know, peace and, and freedom in the United States to, you know, to, this, to this great extent. And I think we can, uh, uh, you know, say how, to if everybody, like Admiral Rickover, would try and lead more, be inspired, try and lead, uh, you know, have high more standards. heroic days. Yeah, have high mm -hmm. standards. Live a, out a more heroic day and lead and, and try to lead more heroic lives, and yes. uh, and we will be back next week, everybody, with more you to celebrate more heroes. We'll be back next week on the Hero Show. So we'll see you then, everybody. Signing off. <laughs>